Okay, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's get started. Um, first question, uh, I, I'd like to uh, clarify is um, a week from now we've got our midterm. Are people aware of that? Okay, so um, what is going to be on the midterm? The midterm will be all the stuff we have done since the first last midterm. That means graph, al graph traversal algorithms. That means weighted graph algorithms. That means backtracking. And that means dynamic programming. Um, how do you pr study for the midterm? Um, again, I think that solving problems is a very good idea. Um, one thing to note is homework five is, um, what you call it? Homework five has um, some dynamic programming problems on it. So homework five is not due till the end of classes, but I recommend people look and do the homework five problems on dynamic programming to give them practice for doing, do, to, to work, to, you know, to, for practice on this stuff. Okay, any questions? Otherwise, the flavor of the exam will be like the previous one. Yeah. Is it a week from today or a week from Thursday? Let, let's, let's, um, okay, let me, let me figure this out. Whatever it said in the syllabus, which did it say in the syllabus? Actually, let me, okay, let me, let me, this is one that's worthy of double checking. It's quite possible I uh, anticipated, looked forward to giving you guys a midterm so much that uh, I may be jumping the gun. Let's look at the schedule here. Um, lecture schedule, kabunk. So today is the ninth. Is not, am I correct about that? That would mean that next class is the 11th. That means we've got a lecture. And the week after that says midterm two, does it not? Okay, so it's a week from today. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so we're gonna have today and another lecture on dynamic programming before the exam. Any questions? And, um, for next class, I'm also willing to answer questions about other stuff next class. So if there's stuff that you want review for or anything like that, next lecture I should have time for doing that. So come prepared if you want, have questions you want to know an answer to or something like that. Any questions? Yes. What was the pizza thing? The pizza thing, unfortunately, has been a, a victim of COVID, okay? I have decided I'm not quite in a uh, COVID class to eat with you people during this semester. So um, normally I like to call people in and uh, have these pizzas with big groups of people. And this, this unfortunately, I decided to ax this because, because of the COVID thing, okay? Which I, which I regret, but... Uh, you know, I've done it every year for the last, um, you know, probably 10 or 15 years. But, uh, okay, any questions about uh, anything? Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today is, um, again, we've been talking about dynamic programming. And uh, the problem of the day is one that I, I really kind of like. Um, it says that uh, you, you're, you're a scientist. I want you to be a scientist studying the properties of eggs. And we know that an egg, if I drop it from a high enough height, the egg breaks. If I drop it from a small height, the egg just bounces or rolls or does whatever egg things does. There is a critical height with, for which if you drop chicken eggs, they will break if you drop them from above it and they will not break if you drop it from below it. And we would like to try to find out what that critical height is. So what do we know? We have a building, okay, uh, which has um, N floors. And, you know, the, the floors are close enough together 
that, you know, presumably we're going to learn something about the critical uh, height of a chicken egg, okay, from this. We know that if we had, the, each floor there's a window, so you can drop, stick your hand out and drop the egg down. We want to figure out what is the critical floor F, where if I drop the egg from floor F, the egg breaks, but I drop the egg from floor F minus 1, it doesn't break. Does everybody kind of get that picture? Okay. And um, the building has n stories. And, you know, if by some miracle the building isn't tall enough to break the egg, we'll say that the critical floor is n plus 1. So what, what is the problem? You, all you can do is take an egg and drop it off a of, of floor and see if it breaks. You start with k eggs, and you want to try to figure out um, what's the smallest number of eggs you can, egg drops you can do. And the critical thing is, of course, that once you dr break an egg, you can't drop it again. You know, it's, it's already broken. It's this kind of messy thing on the floor, right? Any questions? So we can reuse whole eggs that survive the drop, but we can't reuse eggs that are broken. Any questions? Okay. So now, with that picture in mind, let's look, ask, ask some questions. Let E of N, K N be the minimum number of droppings that I know will suffice to learn the critical floor if I am given K eggs and a building with N stories. Okay. My first question is, show me that um, E1N is N. Can anybody show me this? Yes. You're saying that the right strategy, if you have this building, is you drop it from here. If it doesn't break, it, uh, it bounces, 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 splat. Okay, we have found with, if worse comes to worse, we have to toss it off every possible floor. Does everybody see that the increasing, um, what you call it, the uh, kind of drop from the smallest floor and keep going up shows this. Just to make sure people are on board, why, why can't we drop it from the big, tallest floor and keep coming down? Because it, the egg will splat the first time, and then you don't know anything except that the, you know, the critical place is, is somewhere below that. Right? Does everybody believe that? The second thing I want you to do is to kind of show me this, or tell me, let's just say as a simpler question, can someone give me a rough idea of what E of 2 comma N is? If I give you two eggs, what's the right strategy to, to what is the, sorry. If I give you two eggs, what's the right strategy to find the critical uh, part of the building? Does anyone want to propose this situation? We've now got a building. It's got n floors, and you've got two eggs. What should you do with it? to give me a good way to do it. Yes? So one idea is you're saying you're going to use the first egg to drop off on, let's say, the even floors. OK? And we're going to go through and do bounce, bounce, splat. And then you're going to use the second egg to walk backwards somehow in that gap and figure it out, right? How many eggs tosses will you use in the worst case? N over 2, n over two or n over 2 plus 1, right? n over 2 to, in the first case and then 1 to get down. So it's, you know, we have to be a little bit careful as n even on. It's something like n over 2 plus 1, right, according to his strategy. He's proposing a strategy that uses something like n over 2. Can anybody give me a more efficient strategy with two eggs to hit the building? Is 
That is not the optimal strategy with two eggs. Yes? So every time I want the size between my two drops to increase by one, I would have to do Okay, I'm not understanding what you're saying. So you want to keep doubling it. Is that what you're doing? Okay, I'm not, not quite sure I know what, we're, what, what, we're, what, what you're doing yet. Okay, let's try the guy next to you. So, so wait, let, let's, for both of you, tell me what, start from, from, from the first egg on, what are the first several tosses you're going to do? So there are 10 floors total? No, there's a, there's a million floors total. Tell me what we're going to do. Is n to floors total. What are you going to do? I'll start somewhere on around like floor 1,000, and then 1,999. 1,000? What's the next one? 1,199, and then what's the next one? Uh, 2,999. Okay, so now you're skipping by about 1,000. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing here. What would it be for you if we did his algorithm, instead of skipping even odd, what if we skipped by 1,000? If n was big enough, what would happen? If we skip by a thousand, what would be the total number of egg tosses that you would be doing? Okay, so you're going to hit a thousand, the thousandth floor, the two thousandth floor, the three thousandth floor, the four thousandth floor, splat, come on down. What's the worst case number of floors that we're going to use? Hit. Egg tosses we would use. 2,000? First of all, it should be a function of n. If my building had n floors, okay, and let's say I decided to do every thousandth floor, which is about what I'm seeing you do, okay, what would be the, how many tosses would I need? Yeah? Does everybody see that if we're skipping every thousandth floor, it's going to be n divided by 1,000, because if what's going to happen in the worst case? In the worst case, the egg survives, 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 goes splat. Then you've got to walk down with the other egg, the last 1,000. So that's going to be n over 1,000 plus 1,000 which in a big O sense is now something like n over 1,000. Does everybody agree? Any questions? Do we agree that doing a split of n over 1,000 is kind of better than a split of, of, of every even odd floor, assuming n is very big? But is 1,000 going to be the, right, the optimal answer here? How far do we want to split, okay? How many floors do we want? If we have two eggs, we have a building of a thousand of n floors. Let's think in terms of n. What is the place where we should toss off the eggs? Any, you, you, some, someone with a hand, I thought I saw a hand. What? What kind of algorithm? So, uh, split it into six, and then the first, and then you drop the first one half, half, and then the second one at a third, or something like that. Because, um, because the idea, idea is that if both eggs are, uh, if both eggs survive, then you can, then you know that it's going to be higher than a half. So, so you use both eggs and go there and drop, and drop. A okay. So first of all, you should be using one egg at a time. 
So the, I mean, in some sense, you're going to be drossing one egg and seeing if it breaks. It's certainly not an advantage to try to toss two eggs at the same time. Because if they both break, you're out of luck, right? So I claim you're going to want to toss one egg at one time. And um, one idea that maybe you were saying, I don't know, was to toss it in the middle. What would happen if we did binary search with the first egg? OK. Suppose we toss the first egg at n over 2. And then, depending upon if it, sur if it um, survives, what are we going to do? If it survives, then we'll look at n over 3, 3n three over 4, right? Suppose we do binary search on it and then do the linear search. How many tosses will we make in the worst case? Yeah? N over 2. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? You toss it bravely off at the middle and it breaks, right? Then all you can do is start walking up from here again. And then you'll discover, oops, here's where it broke. Okay? What is the right place to toss off the first egg if you've got a building of size n? Does anybody have any idea? Now, in here, this course, we haven't really talked about divide and conquer, but I like the, it's sort of like binary search is a divide and conquer algorithm. You break the problem into smaller parts. You want the work to be done, whether you break the egg or not, to be the same thing. I am going to claim that the right place to toss it is at the square root nth place. Then, sorry, oops, boom. Then the two square root nth place, three square root nth place. Does everybody get that? When it finally hits the nth floor, what, how much times n, square root n is it to get n? What? Square root of n. Does everybody agree that with n, the, the, the nth floor is square root n times n? Right? So what's going to happen? In the worst case, we're going to make square root n tosses and finally discover that the egg breaks up here. Right? And then where would we toss from? We would go from the square root of n minus first times square root n floor. This place the egg survived, right? And walking up here, does everybody see that the gap between the two of these things is going to be what? The gap between here and here is going to be square root n. OK? I want you to think about this for a while. It has nothing to do with dynamic programming yet. But for just understanding the asymptotics of this thing, do you see that if we had that they would end things, if we tossed it off at square root n, 2 square root n, 3 square root n, dot, 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 square root n minus 1 times square root n, and then square root n times square root n, which is equal to n. If we did it every square root nth number of floors, we would be tossing off a total of square root n times till we found a group that was of size square root n. OK? If the egg broke here but didn't break here, then we have square root n moves to get up from then on. I want to claim that this argument shows that e of 2nk is going to be less than or equal to 2 times square root n. How many people see why it's 2 times square root n? How many people don't and want to? Okay, at least one. Okay, so let's try that again. 
What is the idea that I want to do? He wanted to break it every, every other floor. Two, four, eight, six, eight, dot, dot, dot. He wanted to do a thousand, two thousand, three thousand. Okay? What if, but if, what if we do square root n, two square root n, three square root n, four square root n? It should be clear that by the time we get the square root n times square root n, we get n. So I claim that they're going to be exactly square root n of these red levels. Right? You see what I did with that? Red, red, red. The gap between, what's the gap between square root n and 2 square root n? What is 2 square root n minus square root n? What is it? Square root n, right? The gap between any two of these is square root n. So what is my procedure going to be? I am going to go try these big level things every square root n, and then when something broke, I'm going to walk up with my other egg, okay, to find where the transition are. I'm doing at most square root n of the first kind, and at most square root n of the second kind, and that's why this is at most 2 times square root n. Any questions? Okay, so this required some cleverness, right? Now, let's do something that doesn't require cleverness, but will give us the exact answer, okay? For all k and all n. Can you find a recurrence relation to tell me what is the minimum number of eggs droppings that suffice given k eggs and n floors. How would we find what the minimum number of, um, of, of such tosses are? Or write a recurrence to tell us what that is. People see what I want to do? I want to now write, I want us to now use our dynamic programming component. We'll say that E of, what was it, Kn is the, is the optimal number of tosses In the worst case, to find the critical height with k eggs and n floors. Does everybody agree that's what this is what we want? If we knew this, this would tell us the optimal answer. We could use this recurrence to find it for any n and for any k. Right? Can you come up with a recurrence relation now to tell us what this is? Let's start to work out a recurrence relation for this. Any question about what we're trying to do here? Okay. Any proposals as to how you would make a recurrence relation out of this? Yeah? Okay, you're saying, what? first of all, you're saying, suppose we toss the floor or the egg off at floor X. What is the cost of the job to be done? And what do you say it is? Uh, it's the minimum of E. Um, the minimum of what? Uh, K minus 1 F. E K minus 
E, K minus 1, oh, sorry, X, and what? Okay, what is he saying here? Okay, does everybody see what that recurrence is doing? What is he saying? He's saying, what happens if I toss the egg out at floor X? There are two things that can happen. It bounces or it splats, right? How much work is done when it, when it goes splat? Well, if I tossed the thing out, if this was my building, I tossed it out at floor X, and it went splat, okay? What do I know? The optimal answer is the division line is going to be somewhere between, instead of being between 1 and N, it's between what? 1 and X. Actually, you know it breaks at x, doesn't it? I think I like x minus 1 here better. Right? And what if not? He's saying then, in that case, the egg is going to not split here. It is going to split somewhere between x plus 1 and n. Okay. Do we agree with that? And how many numbers are there between n, x and n plus 1? Well, he's telling me there's n minus, he's telling me it's n minus x plus 1. That's what I'm hearing. Let's just see if I can get this right, because I always have these indices I get confused by. What if it was the 10th floor and uh, I had bro the egg broke on the 5th floor? How many floors are there from now on? It's the floor 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 floors left. I've got N minus, um, it looks like x plus 1, okay, so that would be 10 minus um, x plus 1 or 6 would be equal to 4. Actually, there are not, there's five floors here. Do we agree? Okay, we have to get this index right. Do we agree that we would put an extra plus one here? Let's go figure this out now. Okay, I want to get the index just right because the index matters, right? We tossed it off on the X floor and it bounced, right? That's what this case is, it bounced. So now, what is the subproblem that we have left? I claim it is something that starts from the x plus first floor, goes to the nth floor, right? How many floors are there from the x plus first floor to the nth? Oh. What? N minus x. So you want to add a 1 to it, right? I think that that's right. No. N minus, okay, if x here was equal to 5, remember we tossed it off on the fifth floor, and the floor had 10 buildings, we want the, the answer to be 5, right? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. So in that case, it's N minus x is what we're agreeing on, right? So let's do it that way. Do we agree? I'm saying we need an extra one because we dropped one at the x So it's parentheses n minus x and then plus one at the x. Okay, so you want to say n minus x plus one? No, um, it's e a n minus x, so all that's in one. And then we add one because we 
Do we believe this becomes n plus n minus x? Uh, what I think he's saying is that we add one to the whole result of the min operation. Right? Okay. Outside the min operation, you do plus one. Okay, he's asking something different. You're saying something important. You're saying I'm going to say one plus. This is the cost of the egg that we dropped, right? This is the toss. But the floors that are left, I claim was n minus x. Do you agree? OK. So let's get the index right. And I think we're agreeing this is n minus x. OK? Now, what floor should we toss? Does everybody see that that's what the answer is going to be? It's going to be actually, I guess you want to say something like this. Maybe this is what you're trying to tell me here. We're going to pay one for dropping the egg. And then once it's done, the job we have is either going to be this or this, right? And how many tosses do we want here? Do we want this to be the min? Or do we want that to be the max? OK. If we toss it off on x, is the egg going to bounce or is it going to break? In the worst case, it's whatever's going to cause us the most pain, right? So should this be a min or a max? Max, does everybody see why that is? If we toss the egg off on the x floor, either it will bounce or break. We pay one for tossing it off, and it'll either bounce or it'll, it'll either bounce or it'll break. Okay. And if we want to count the worst thing that can happen, that's going to be the max of those two counts, right? People see why it's a max. Yeah. Or you just say you see it? OK. Let's say it wasn't. Let's take a look at this. Suppose we were using our first egg and tossed it out on the first floor, right? One of two things could happen. The egg broke or the egg didn't break. What do we want to have happen? You're, someone's giving you this lousy job of tossing eggs off of a building. If you toss an egg off the first floor, do you want it to bounce or to break? Break. Why do you want it to break? Because then your job's done, right? Now, if we did this thing, we, we, the smaller, if we tossed, if x was equal to 1, let's say, OK? This would be the cost of it breaking. This would be the cost of it bouncing, right? If it had broken on the first floor, maybe we had like zero more tosses to do, right? On this side, we had something like n more tosses to do, right? If we had this as a min, we would be saying, yes, if I get lucky, I'm going to have the egg break the first time. If I'm guarding on the worst case, I want the bigger of these two. Isn't that right? Does that make sense? So I want a max. Now, what x should I toss this thing off on? This tells me, once I know x, this will tell me how, let me calculate how much work I have left to do. What is the x that I should toss it off on? Yeah? What? I'm not, I'm not hearing, I'm afraid. Do we try all x? Yes, let's try all. And what are we going to be trying all as? What are all the possible x? One to what? And what do we want to do over all of those things? 
What does try all mean? We could do, yeah? Okay, let's look at this now and see if this makes any sense. Okay, this says we want to, what, what floor do you want to toss the egg off? I want to toss it off on the best one. What is the best one? The one that minimizes the worst case toss cost. Isn't that right? And this is kind of doing what we're doing. We're going to say that for, for you know, what, what, what are we going to do? We're going to want to pick the x, OK, that minimizes the worst case toss. The worst case toss means that if we toss it out here, depending upon whether it breaks or bounces, there is work to be done. This is the work that's left after a break. This is the work that's left after a bounce. We want to find the, the, the worst case, the, the max of those is the worst case. And we want to minimize, we want to toss it off on the floor that minimizes the worst case. This, I claim, is our recurrence. OK? Any questions about that? People see where the recurrence comes from? How many people see it? OK, how many people don't see it? OK, how many people don't see it and don't want to see it? I mean, there's some people like that. OK, is there anything we've forgotten here? Is there a basis case? What is the basis cases for this recurrence? Yeah? Um, what, what are the basic cases? OK, one basis case that you might say is E of 1 comma n is equal to n. That looks to me like a case. That means we're never going to get down to 0 eggs. What happens if we get, what is actually E of 0 comma n? What if 0 eggs and you have to do it? This is probably either infinite or undefined or something bad news. This is bad karma, right? So we don't want this case to come up. This case comes up, it's hopeless, right? I guess e of 0, except e of 0, 0, I think we actually use. If you have 0 eggs and 0 floors, I think 0 tosses will suffice, right? Any questions? OK. Now, what is the runtime of this recurrence? OK. If you're going to use dynamic programming, what is the running time of this recurrence? OK. How do I count the running time of this recurrence? I ask myself, how many boxes and how much time per box, right? How, much, how many boxes are there? K times N. The, number of, the total number of eggs times the total number of floors. So there are K times n boxes. What is the running time? How much time does it take to fill in each box? OK, look at the recurrence. OK, I think I want everybody to stare at this recurrence and tell me how much does it take to fill in each one of these things. OK, this is a good practice for everybody. OK, I'm going to add 1. That takes constant time. I'm going to look something up, look something up, and take the max of that. How much time does it take to look something up? Look something up and take the max of it. How much time? Constant. And I'm going to take constant time for each floor. 
This is going to loop around how many times? N times. I claim it's N time per box. This is a K times N squared algorithm. Okay. Any questions about that? Any questions of how we formulated this recurrence? Which again, the recurrence, you may say, that looks so complicated. But it's not so complicated once you see this. We kind of did walk, work this out. Okay? And the running time of the algorithm comes directly from the, uh, the thing. Any questions? Now, what does this have to do with that square root n thing that I did here? Remember, see, I got the square root n thing? Where is that square root n? OK. Can anybody see this? You really understand, you'll see where it is. OK. It is kind of just implicit in what the values in this table will be if you started out with k equals 2. Do you agree that what this is going to do is tell you if k was, if you ran this with 2 comma n, what would happen? You would be building a table which was something like 2 by n, right? And it will tell you what is the optimal strategy to toss an egg. In fact, how do we read off what is the optimal strategy to toss the egg from this? This tells you the minimum number of egg tosses. How would you, you run this thing and then tell you how to do it in that many tosses? What do we have to keep track of in order to know how many to what's the right sequence of tosses to do? What is the first place we're going to toss off the egg? Does everybody agree that we're going to toss off the egg at the x that minimizes this? Right? This x here is going to be telling us what, the, what happened if we tossed it off on floor 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The min is going to say what was the right floor to be on, right? If we want to reconstruct that, we've got to keep track of not just the cost, but what was the x that yielded that cost. Does everybody kind of get that idea? That's like the parent in any of these other dynamic programming problems. We would have to keep track of what was the move that we made. We would have found that the optimal answer was tossing it off on the 17th floor. And then once we knew that, we could then reconstruct it by going, if we tossed it off on the 17th floor, then, depending upon whether it broke or did not break, it was in two different halves. By following back this chain of what was the, optim the arg max here, the arg min, the x that, that, that kept track of that, it enabled us to reconstruct what was the egg tossing order. Any questions about this? OK. Any comments? Anything like this? OK. Let's clear the screen. Sorry about that. Any call talk about this problem? Again, once you've seen enough of these recurrences and thought about them, they kind of get, you can kind of wrap, read them off. You know, it takes a while to see it, but ultimately this is the kind of thing that can be kind of worked out just from print logic principles. Any questions? Okay, good. In that case, I want to now go back to our edit distance.
problem. Because edit distance was the, is probably the, oh, sorry about that. Edit distance is probably the most famous uh, dynamic programming problem that comes up in practice a lot. We talked about it last time. Edit distance was about how do you find the smallest sequence of changes between two springs. And where did I have it? Here was my edit distance matrix. Just to re review this question that we had before. How did I figure out, in, remember, what was the idea in edit distance? In edit distance, if we go back to our recurrence, maybe I'll go back just to that just for one quick review to make sure people really see this. My edit distance recurrence was we defined the function dij as the minimum number of changes to convert the first i characters of s into the first oops, j characters of t. Dij was the minimum of, we could either end it on a, a, sub, a, a match, a substitute, an insertion, or a deletion. The cost was for any of the changes we paid one, just like we paid one out there for this, uh, you know, the actual egg toss. And we had, just like the other ones, sorry about this, this sounds right bad. And, and just like the other ones, we had a cost of getting there. In this case, if we match the last characters, then the cost is going to be what it took to get to the last characters. Matching the prefix of i minus 1, j minus 1, or i minus 1, j minus 1, if it substitute the same issue. Otherwise, if it was an insertion into s, that meant that we were adding a character to match something in the other string. T got short by something. Okay? Or we deleted something from the top string because it wasn't going to match the bottom one. And then that was taking one off the first string. Any question about this recurrence? Okay. Now, how do we reconstruct the order of what we were doing? What the changes were? Again, here was my, um, let me come back, here was my dynamic programming version of it. Notice that in my matrix, I kept track of at each point the cell, the cost, and the parent. What was the direction that it took to get to where I wanted to be? Okay. Likewise on this thing. If I want to reconstruct my sequence of thoughts, I need to keep track of what was that x that, the, that minimized the cost of the job. And when I built my dynamic programming program version, sorry about this, here was my dynamic programming version. What did I do? Okay. I am going to find the cost of ending on a match, a min, an insert, or a delete by the cost of what happens at the end of the characters. Presumably indel is going to be 1, because every time I insert or delete a character, I should pay 1. Match is going to pay either 0 or 1, depending upon whether s sub i equals t of j. And um, the cost was going to be the cost of getting to the prefix. This piece of code was simply taking the min of these three quantities, but not only keeping the cost of the min, if the cost was less than the best I have so far, opt goes down, but I also know that the direction that I came from is either that I came from a match, a delete, or an insert. This is going to tell me which direction did I get, take to get to the cell ij. 
Okay? And um, that is what I'm doing over here. Any questions? Any questions about edit distance? Again, think about, just to make sure you really get this, Think about what happens. Work through this example. Thou shalt to you should. The key idea of dynamic programming is that whenever I wanted to fill in a cell, let's say this cell, it was going to be the optimum, the min of three possibilities. And the possibilities depended upon here, on this cell over here, T does not match, okay, um, well, are you an O? So I can either pay, get, go back here and pay a substitution, that would be 9 plus 1, or I could do 10 plus 1, or I could do 8 plus 1. The minimum of them was 9. That tells me that to get to this point, I could do this in... 1 plus 8, and my parent was going to be that cell. Any questions about that? Any questions about this dynamic programming thing and how edit distance works? Okay. And that if you wanted to reconstruct what the sequence was, what I needed to do is at the end... I wanted to edit the whole thou shalt into you should. The parent relationship was going to give me pointers back to what the uh, parent was. That happens to be what the parent chain followed. Once I take my parent chains back here, it says, how do I change thou shalt into a... Um, you should? Well, it looks like I'm going to add a T. I'm going to substitute a Y into an H. I'm going to match the O, match the U, match the space, match the S, match the H. Uh, I believe here... I'm going to decide that I am going to remove the O. That's what this is doing. Then substitute the U for an A. Then match the, the L. And then substitute the D for the T. This transcript of following back the parent pointers gives us that, uh, what you call it, the, what, what the sequence of changes was. Any questions? So we not only are finding the cost of the distance, we're finding the sequence of operations that yielded that cost to turn one string into another. Any questions? Any questions about this stuff? Okay. Now, my edit distance code was general enough that you could use it for solving other problems. And that one of the reasons why edit distance, I mean, edit distance, I think, if you think about it, uh, captures, uh, what you call it, captures the idea of, you know, spelling correction. What's this number of spelling corrections I need to make to turn this word into that? What's the sequence of operations? Um, but there are other problem variations of, of edit distance. And it turns out that the basic dynamic programming cap implementation I give will solve many of these versions. If you looked at my code, you'll notice I defined my initialization in terms of row and column initialization functions. Okay, getting the, the uh, basis conditions right. I defined that the match cost and the insertion and deletion cost in terms of a function, if I want to use edit distance for something else, maybe changing either the initialization or the cost penalties, 
will make it do what I want. Okay? I also had a function, if you looked at my original thing, that said, where do you think the ultimate end of your, your um, of, of what you really want, the end point of your solution is? Okay? And for edit distance, editing the entire string here into the entire string here, the lower right cell was the end point. But for other variations of this, that might not be true. Okay, and what I'd like to do now is talk about a couple of other variants here, okay, where uh, that might be the case. Let's look at the problem now. Sorry if I'm having trouble today. Where I want to edit not an entire string into an, a, a, another string, but I want to edit, um, what you call it, an entire string into part of another string. Let's imagine a world where um, I wanted to find out whether someone had plagiarized part of a paper. Okay? If you have a paper here, that this is your long-term paper, and this you copied out of Skeena's book, okay? What would be the edit thing that you want? You could imagine a world where if I want to know, did you copy a particular phrase from Skeena's book? This could be the phrase from Skeena's book. This is going to be the passage. And this is going to be your entire paper. Okay? You can imagine a world where you'd like to know, is there a place where a small pattern appears, maybe with spelling mistakes, in a giant string? Okay? Before I told you what's the cost of editing all of one string into all of the other string. Here our problem is a little bit different. We want you to have all the passage, but we don't know where in the paper it starts. Does everybody kind of get that idea? We'd like to find where is, in this paper, it turns out that this was the right place, where you had copied it in your term paper. And it turned out that when you're copying it, to, maybe to try to fool me or because you're a bad speller, you made a couple of spelling mistakes. You see now what I'd like to do? I'd like to be able to figure out where does this passage exist best in this string. Okay? Before I wanted to know what's the cost of editing the entire string into the entire string. Here I want to edit a, the entire string into a part of the passage. Okay? Do people see that this is a slightly different problem? How many people see it's a slightly different problem? How many people don't see it's a slightly different problem? Let's think about it differently. Suppose we wanted to know where the word skina appears in the Bible. Now skina, I, I think I've broken it to you before, does not appear in the Bible, right? But what would happen if we did the edit distance from skina to the Bible when was in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth and he saw it was good and da 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 da. Right? What is going to happen when we try to find the, the editing skeena into the entire Bible? What is the cheapest cost matching of this going to look like? Can anybody think what that pattern is going to look like? 
I claim that what's going to happen is you're going to go through the thing. In the beginning, God created the heavens. Uh, ding, ding, ding. And there was an S, right? And the optimal thing was probably delete, 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 delete. Match the S. And then afterwards, ba 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 ba. Somebody was the king, and I deleted a lot. And then, Bing, there was a king, right? And you see what's happening. Then somewhere afterwards, somebody said, "Oh my God, I am in trouble." Okay, boom. Do you kind of see what the optimal alignment is going to look like? It's going to consist of matches. Of, there's certainly going to be in the Bible an S followed by a K, followed by an I, followed by an E, followed by an N, followed by an A, with big gaps between it. Does everybody kind of see that? The edit cost of saying where does Skeena fit best in the Bible, if we did it like we did it before, is going to be the length of the Bible minus the length of Skeena, which is six. Okay? Any questions about that? How can we shop, find the spot where, suppose there was a place where they went skiing, what we would really like to find is where was the close place where this pattern occurred most closely? Okay? Do people see what I'm trying to do here, or not really? Okay. What is the difference between the problem of string matching, okay, which we did before, and the problem of substring matching? My claim is we still want to do an edit distance-like thing, okay, but we want it to start at the best possible place. Do you see that in this case, if it's skiing and skiing, we really want to discover that, hey, if we started looking over here, there was a way to change skiing to skiing at a cost of only one. Okay? In edit distance, what did it cost to edit the empty string into the first n characters? Does remember what happened? How much did it cost to take to edit the empty string into the a string of length n characters? How much did that cost? N. What do we want that to be in the substring problem? I claim I want editing the empty string into n characters now to cost zero. So I claim that, that, that I can solve my edit distance problem, my substring problem, is going to be solved by a different initialization condition. Instead of saying the cost of editing n to the empty string is the empty string to n is going to be n. I'm going to say the empty string to n is going to be zero. And what I'm going to be wanting to now know is the bottom string. What is the optimal cost of getting um, x comma m? X comma M is going to be what? This is the cost of getting from, uh, what you call it, the first X characters of this to the first M characters of this. Okay? My claim is going to be that by changing the initialization condition from 0 to, from, from it being N, for any prefix to zero, if I set every prefix to zero to be zero, and then I look for where in the bottom row is there the cheapest entry in this thing, I will find where is the point 
where this whole pattern matched an, at an end point in the text at cheapest cost. Any questions? I can tell I'm bombing here, so I'm not really sure this is doing too well. But what am I saying here? This other problem of substring matching, which maybe I'm going to encourage you to look at in the book, basically can be solved, okay, just by um, changing the initialization conditions so that now the initialization condition starts at zero instead of n. And if we look at the, look as our goal cell is some cell from the bottom row of the matrix, not just the one that's the whole cost of editing all of this to all of that. So taking the min of the bottom row is what will determine what the goal cell is. Any questions? Okay. That I can tell is bombed out. Let me give you another problem that's maybe a relatively simple one. I think I want us to work this one out on the board. There's two different ways to do this. One is by coming up with its a new recurrence, and the other is by doing an edit distance thing. But let's try to come up with a new recurrence for this. Suppose, let's say, that we are given a um, sequence of numbers. Okay? The maximum monotone sequence seeks to have, basically, either delete the fewest number of elements or equivalently keep the largest number of elements that forms an increasing sequence. Does everybody see that we can go from 2 to 3 to 5 to 6 to 8? And that is a sequence of five digits that go bigger and bigger. Does everybody see that? You can imagine we are given an input of a sequence of numbers, and we want to know what is the largest subsequence of numbers that will be increasing as we walk along that subsequence. Okay? What order of, suppose I give you the numbers 1 through n, what order of them will have the longest um, increasing subsequence? Yeah? If I sorted them from biggest to smallest, what order will have the shortest longest increasing subsequence? Yeah? Sort them in the reverse order, right? How can I find what the length of the longest increasing subsequence is? You see what my problem is now? I give you a set, a, a, an array of n numbers, and I want to find what is the... Okay, can I erase this now? Or does anybody still want to take a picture quickly? Okay, I'm going to get rid of it. Let's now look at the problem of how do we find the longest monotone increasing sequence. Okay? How would I do this? The first question I ask myself is, is there, so just to remember what our problem is, we're giving a, a, a set of numbers S1 dot 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 S to N, and we want to find the longest increasing sequence from left to right, right? How would we do this? We need to first define a number, a, a, a function that would tell us the answer if we knew how to evaluate it. What would be a function that might be interesting? Let's call it C of what? Yeah? You want to say C of I. C of I is going to be what? The uh, longest subsequence of the first I, uh, I element. 
Okay, let's say that C of i is the length of the longest subsequence. Now here I want to know precisely what you want to know. What is it that you want to know? Okay, you want to say of the first i elements. Okay, so suppose my sequence was looking like one, two, three. Actually, let's say let's say five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, four. What would C of I be? You would say that it's what? One. Okay, now maybe we're going to do this, but you're saying that it's going to be, this is to make sure of it, you're going to keep track of the best one ever. Okay, now I agree that if this is true, under this definition, the answer that you want is going to be C, uh, C of N. Does everybody see that? But can you come up with a recurrence for this? It's a little bit unclear to me what you're going to do with all these cases. Here, these numbers don't seem to be doing you much good. Right? Do you kind of see that idea? Okay, I'm going to say, let me do it my way since we're running out of class. Length of the longest sequence, I want to say ending at S of I. Okay, so let's think about what that would mean. By my version, what would it be? What's the longest sequence ending after the first one? One, two, three. What's this one? What's the longest sequence ending at this point? One. What's the longest sequence here? Two. What's the longest sequence there? Okay, you see how I've got a different definition? I'm going to claim mine is easier to come up with a recurrence for. What's the optimal cost of ending at a particular value? Okay. I am going to claim it is going to be what? We want to max over something. What do we want to max over? Okay. Right, I'm going to give a special case. Let's say that the first one was zero. What could I maximize over to do this? Okay. I claim I'm going to max over all J. And I'm going to say that it's going to be equal to C of J plus 1, right? The longest sequence that, that ends at 4 is going to be what? One longer than it's extending something, right? Does everybody agree that it's one longer than some C of S of J, C of J, sequence ending at J? What are the rate bounds on this? Yeah? From the beginning of the I. I to what? 
from, from J goes from 1 to I, I guess. This would be it, right? Is this recurrence right? Yeah? You want to say I minus 1? Yeah, because we can't. If it, was, if it was I, I'd be doing an infinite loop. Is this recurrence right? What's this recurrence going to do? As it's written right now, I can tell you exactly what it's going to do. It's going to put down 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Does this recurrence depend at all upon the sequence of values? So what do I need to do to make it depend on that? Yeah? You're going to say the max over all Rj such that, what was that? Okay, this is what the answer is now, okay? What are we saying? We can S, C sub I can be one longer than C of J if J is less than I, meaning it's to the left of it, and the value of S of I is bigger than S of J. Does everybody see that? This is what's going to do what we want, okay? Any questions about that? How many people sort of see that this is doing now what we want? Okay? What is the basis case here? What basis case do I know the value of? What is, C, is there a C of what that I know the value of? What? One. You're going to say you know that C of 1 is 1. That's probably a good case. Actually, I prefer C of 0 equals zero. And then this first one becomes, comes out here. If I had my first value of my sequence was minus infinity, it would, you know, I could kind of make sure that it always will grow from it. What's the running time of this recurrence? Let's just stop to think about it. In this recurrence, what is the space involved and what is the running time of it? How many boxes do I have? Okay. How many, uh, what you call it? How much time per box am I going to take? N. Does everybody see this is going to loop around as many as N times? I'm going to have to each time compare two characters. If the characters are in alignment, then I'm going to look something up and add one to it, right? This I claim is going to be O of one time per box, 